everyone and welcome to the 34th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, just to highlight that some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and our witnesses will be briefing us today via video conference. Um, I will also be chairing this morning's meeting via Starleaf as per standing order 110 paragraph 3 regarding temporary provisions for statutory committees. Um, any member, which states that any member of a committee, including the chairperson and deputy chairperson, may attend a meeting remotely, for example, by video link or telephone attendance. So this morning's meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. So just to remind uh, members, as always, to, to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. So item number one on the agenda is apologies. Peter, will you just um, clarify who we've received apologies from? Chair, I'm expecting full attendance. I haven't had any apologies thus far. And we're not aware of any, so if you want to proceed. Chair, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So there, there are no apologies that we're aware of. Okay. Um, and uh, what happened there, Peter, I um, muted my own tablet device and then couldn't hear anybody. But anyway... Don't, don't um, do that. No, apologies. Don't do that. Um, so moving on then to item number two, which is the draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of the minutes from last week's meeting of the 7th of October at page four in your packs. Our members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on then, we are going to item number eight on the agenda, um, which is the SR um, SR 2020-214, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, Coronavirus Schedule 8, Early Termination of Certain Temporary Provisions Regulations, NIE 2020. Um, there is a clerk memo at page 121 of your pack. Um, and just to remind members, the SR 2020-214 um, is at page 123 of your packs and the explanatory memorandum is at page 126. Um, members will remember that we dealt with the SL1 at last week's meeting and it was agreed um, by the committee and there have been no changes to the policy content. This statutory rule will provide for certain temporary modifications made by the Act to the Insolvency Northern Ireland Order 1989, the 1989 Order and extended by the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, Amendment of Certain Relevant Periods Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 to terminate before the current expiration date of the 30th of March 2021. Termination will instead occur today, the 14th of October 2020, and the reason for this is that these specific provisions are no longer required by the HMRC following modifications to the Act and will no longer apply to the 1989 order. These changes have already come into force in Britain on the 1st of October. So this rule is subject to negative resolution. Are members content with the SR? Great. Members are content. Chair. Okay. That the Committee for the Economy has agreed SR 2020-214, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, Coronavirus Schedule 8, Early Termination of Certain Temporary Provisions, Regulations NI 2020, and recommends that it is confirmed by the Assembly subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. Okay then, so moving back to item number three, which is Chair's Business. Um, at point 9.8 of um, correspondence, there at page 174 of a pa of the pack, there is a press release from the audit off regarding the report on generating electricity from renewable energy, which was published yesterday morning. Um, have uh, can members agree to to look at that piece of correspondence, please? Members agreed. Yes. Thank you. Yes, chair. Members are agreed. Yeah. Okay. 
So that the Renewable Obligation or NIRO scheme reports um, covers a range of areas from the forecasting the total maximum cost to all UK suppliers of purchasing renewable obligation certificates generated here in the north, the use of wind energy and examines um, anaerobic digestion plants specifically, which break, and anaerobic digestion as members are likely aware breaks down organic mass matter to produce biogas. However, the report also highlights a lack of communication between departments and agencies resulting in environmental and planning risks not being identified and managed. Um, the scheme was intended to incentivize the development of electricity generated from renewable energy sources. Um, the Controller and Auditor General has indicated that while the scheme has succeeded in helping exceed local targets, the financial return for some investors may have been more generous than needed. Um, the NIRO is a market-based net mechanism where renewable generators are issued with renewable obligation certificates or ROCs for each unit of electricity generated. The scheme is not funded by taxation. Instead, renewable generators sell the certificates to electricity suppliers throughout the UK who use them to demonstrate compliance with their obligation to source an, a certain proportion of electricity they supply from renewable sources. The report forecasts that the total maximum cost to all UK suppliers of purchasing rocks generated here to help meet the renewables obligations between its inception in 2005 and when it finally ends in 2037 to be 5 billion, including 1.25 billion as forecasted to cost to all NIE suppliers to meet their obligations. The cost of all locks, irrespective of origin, is passed on by electricity suppliers to consumers as part of their electricity bills, and approximately 85% of all electricity produced from renewable sources here comes from onshore wind and is produced by 1,282 wind generating stations. There are three times the number of small scale standalone turbines per square kilometre here than in Britain. The report identifies a higher number, a higher level of financial support from the Nairo for these type of turbines from 2014 until the closure of the scheme in, on the 30th of June 2016 um, and that the potential rate of return could be in excess of 20% with the payback period of less than four years on the original investment. The report identifies a number of risks and concerns and acknowledges that the scheme was fundamental in enabling the North to exceed its target of 40% electricity consumption from renewable um, sources. The report also makes a, a number of recommendations. So if members are agreeable, um, I would like to request that department officials come in to brief the committee um, on, on the report. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on then, uh, there will be an informal teams meeting with the anti-fracking group LAMP tomorrow um, regarding the potential petroleum license applications that um, may or may not be granted. Members will have been aware there was a debate yesterday on the issue um, in the Assembly. So that invitation has already been issued to members and the meeting will take place um, at 11am um, tomorrow. So just to make members aware of that. Um, the Minister has stated in previous correspondence to the committee that she can confirm that no decisions will be taken on whether or not to grant petroleum licences in respect of those two current applications until an outcome of the review um, that has been commissioned is completed and the future petroleum licensing regime will have to be agreed by the executive. So just um, ask members to note the time and date of that informal video call. Mm -hmm. um, and then just a, a, thank you. Um, just a final item then of um, chair's business. Um, obviously, we are going to hear the um, announcements around the um, increased restrictions this morning, um, and there are expected to be um, restrictions around, particularly the hospitality sector, um, but other businesses as well. Um, we also are aware from the announcements um, last Friday that there is an additional 200 million in um, funding made available to the executive um, and some of that obviously will be going towards business support. So I'd like to seek members agreement to, to write to the minister and ask um, what 
support scheme she will be proposing um, for these businesses that are going to be impacted but also importantly the other businesses in the supply chain of those sectors that are ordered to close that won't be able to avail of the job support scheme or the extended job support scheme because they have themselves haven't been ordered to close are our members in agreement with that chair just one point what about the finance minister we write to him as well yeah, um, and obviously the finance minister has um, made available the, the scheme to those businesses in Derry and Straban, and I think at the time he said that that would be extended, but no difficulty also writing to the, the finance minister. Yeah, yeah. Chair, can I suggest that it, it might also be worth the, the same letter going to the first and deputy first minister, um, as the executive is likely, likely to take the lead on a lot of these issues? If yeah, are content. I'm content with that. Okay, thank you. And would you intend to, Chair, just come back when we when we, we resume yeah, again? When we resume again after we get the details, will we further discuss this, perhaps a bit more specifically on on the issues that we want to see addressed? I am happy to do that, Gordon. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Chair. Um, Peter, is there any further items that we can do before yep, Chair, we, we if, if break at 10.30? If you're content, we can start going into uh, item 6, matters arising. Yep, sure. Um, yeah. So, bottom of page. Okay. Yeah, we've got that. So, um, six, item 6.1 is at page 58 of your pack. Um, there is correspondence for, from the Secretary of State to the NI Affairs Committee in regards to qualifying groups. The letter updates the NI Affairs Committee on its approach to delivering unfettered access for businesses to the rest of the UK market. They state that this can be achieved in part through the Internal Market Bill, which enshrines in primary legislation the qualifying NI goods will benefit from mutual recognition and will not be subject to new checks and controls as goods move. Um, to from the north to the rest of the UK. Obviously, we've had briefings over the past few weeks from Professor Katie Hayward, um, from Aidan Conley and the um, department's Brexit group regarding the IM bill and its provisions and potential impact on um, NI businesses in relation to the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. So um, are members content to note or have they any actions to suggest? Um, Peter, can I just maybe suggest that we seek to clarify the impact of that SI? Um, I think it's, it talks about it being temporary until yes, sure. further arrangements are, are in place. But we, can we just um, clarify what the impact would be if there are no further arrangements put in place before the end of the year? Absolutely, Chair. If members are agreed, we will write to the Secretary of State on that. Thank you. Great, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so 6.2 then at page 63 of your pack, there is correspondence from the Minister of State for the North to the Lords EU Committee regarding a briefing follow up on points raised through the Business Engagement Forum and Article 2 of the Protocol. The Business Engagement Forum have held 16 meetings with over 60 businesses from a variety of sectors and geographical regions and the NI office has been in regular contact with the um, Human Rights Commission and Equality Commission um, here in the North to discuss matters relating to the <coughs> operationalisation of the dedicated mechanism to oversee the implementation of Article 2. Um, on the meeting, um, on the 24th of September, the Deputy Chair and myself held an informal meeting with Lord Kinnell the Chair of the House of Lords EU Committee to discuss the implications of the Internal Market Bill um, and the Committee has also corresponded with the NIO regarding the Forum's operations. I think, Peter, we wrote to them again um, a couple of weeks ago. Yes, we did, Chair. Um, we are still waiting for a response on that. Okay, thank you. Are members content to note then until we Great. receive any further correspondence? Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so item 6.3 then, at page 65 of your pack, there is correspondence from the ERA Committee um, on, on the proposed UK Emissions Trading Scheme um, in respect of Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme Order 2020. The ERA Committee has asked for any comments or issues that the Committee wishes to draw to the attention of the ERA Committee. Um, as yet, there's only an outline document for the proposed emissions trading scheme, um, and we have discussed that, or we have considered that at a previous meeting. Um, so, if we would just like to note the, the work done so far by the ERA committee, um, and um, we can seek the views of our stakeholders um, on the economy related aspects of the outline of the UK ETS. Um, our members content then to, to write to the department also to seek its view on the um, emissions trading scheme. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, so 6.4 then, at page 66 of your pack, there is correspondence from the ERA committee um, on the overlap of committee business on EU exit matters. The ERA committee has outlined the following issues to the committee provision of the trader support service to local businesses, good vehicle movement system and the goods movement reference and the HMRC, migrant workers and ferries and clarity around goods moving from the south via local ports into Britain and vice versa. The correspondence indicates that the ERA committee would be grateful for updates on the trader support service, the readiness of the goods vehicle movement system and the good movement reference due to go live on the 1st of January. Um, these issues have been discussed in briefings that the committee has received from EU exit officials. So would members be content to write to the department for a further update that we can then share with the error committee? Yep. Great, yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and Peter, maybe at some point we, we might l like to look at if there are further issues that we, we need to um, discuss with the ERA committee, that's something I suppose that we could keep um, in mind as well, that, that we might want to do a joint sitting at some point around some of these issues when we have a, a bit more clarity. Absolutely, Chair. Once we've got the feedback from stakeholders in the departments and transferred that information onto the ERA committee, it might be useful to have a joint discussion. Yeah. Okay, we we'll, uh, we'll look at a range in that. Okay, thank you. Um, so then 6.5 at page 68 of your pack is correspondence from the UK Finance NI Committee in response to three new bank loan schemes designed to provide financial support to viable businesses that are losing revenue. Are members content to note? Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, at 6.6 .6 then, at page 70 of your pack, there is an Invest NI briefing that the committee got um, last um, Wednesday in respect of the economic recovery and COVID-19. Um, now, members may, we actually didn't receive the, the slides in advance of the meeting because um, they hadn't been cleared by the minister until um, late Tuesday afternoon. So members weren't able to have the opportunity to see those before the meeting. Um, and Peter, I think maybe that's something that, that we should write to the, the minister and department that you know it would be very useful if those could be cleared um, a little bit quicker in future so that members do have the opportunity to see them before the committee meeting. Great, great yeah. That's Thank good. you, Chair, yeah. <laughs> um, and obviously, there, in the slides, um, there were figures about the numbers of applications to um, two of the business support schemes, um, and the numbers on the slides were actually lower than the actual numbers that were quoted to us during the meeting. Um, it's in slide nine of the, the pack, which is page hundred or page seventy eight in our pack, um, around the digital selling capability grant and the equity investment fund, um, and these incorrect figures were then circulated in social media and um, quoted in the media. So regarding the grant, Invest NI CEO has indicated that there have been thirty um, applications submitted rather than the five that is quoted in the slide. Um, and the application for the grant closed on the 7th of October and that they were expecting the number of applications to arise um, and we will be getting an update on that in due course. 
With respect to the equity investment fund, four applications to the fund have been made, not the three that is quoted on the slide. Okay. And this fund is actually open for applications until the 31st of December. Um, and again, it's anticipated that not the number of applications um, will rise substantially between now and then. So are members content to note that clarification? And thank you. Thank you. Chair, um, this... and I, 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 sorry, go ahead, Peter. Chair, this might be an opportune minute to suspend because I appreciate it's just about 25 past and members will need to get to the chamber. But Chair, you were about to say something. No problem. Yeah. I was just going to say, obviously, we um, last week at the meeting did ask um, Invest to, to share with us some further information around um, how they uh, reach the, the schemes that they do. So that's something that obviously we'll be continuing to um, pursue with them. Chair, absolutely. I've, I've already been in contact with them on that, and we, other have, we have other information flows uh, are now in place. We'll be able to bring a lot more to committee. So if you're content, Chair and members, we suspend until after the statement. Great. great. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. This is the Northern... I don't even mind that it's bad. It's when they tell Chair, you it's good. can you hear us? No, it's tell you it's not, and I'm using it. <laughs> so kids waving. Chair, can you hear us? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. We can't hear you. She's not speaking. Yes. Tommy, do you want to leap over and have another go at her? Please don't. Chair, we, we think it may be a, yeah. a, a volume issue in here, so we're just adjusting. I can hear you, Chair. Hey. Chair, Good, if Gary can hear me. <laughs> Maybe we'll just conduct the meeting ourselves. Go ahead, Chair. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. Chair, I think we're, we're good to go. Thanks. If you want to return right. to um, agenda item four for the first briefing. Okay. Yeah. And you, you just know the sticker's going to go through. Okay, so um, if I just refer member, members to the clerk's memo at page 13 of your pack, there's a departmental briefing on the monitoring round at page 17 and a briefing paper that the committee received regarding the department's bid to the summer exercise at page 29. Um, have we all of our officials there, Peter? Chair, yes. Sharon and Joanna are there if Sharon. you want to get them lifted into the spotlight. Yep, so could we please bring into the spotlight Sharon Hetherington, Director of Finance at DFE, and Joanna Park, Accountant, Financial Management at DFE. And um, if I can invite the officials then to make an open statement. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, as you said, I'm joined by my colleague Joanna Park. The paper members have in front of them this morning describes my department's response to the October monitoring exercise. As you'll be aware, the monitoring exercise, which typically occurs three times each year, allows departments to realign its budget allocation on the basis of emerging need. The flexibility in budgetary management afforded to departments is normally limited. Typically, it is limited to facilitating the reallocation of small amounts without recourse to the Department of Finance and the Executive. However, given the need for departments to respond more quickly to address emerging pressures, the executive agreed that departments could be given flexibility to reallocate non-ring fence budgets to meet emerging pressures. The paper describes in some detail the easements, budget pressures, the reallocations that have been made, and then the further bids that have been made for additional funding. I won't, re sorry, I won't repeat this detail in these introductory remarks, but I will briefly summarise for you the headline figures. In total, and rounded to the nearest million pounds, our Minister has approved the reallocation of 13 million pounds of Resource Dale non-ring fence budget to fund a nine million pounds over commitment carried forward from June monitoring and four million of emerging pressures. There is a reduced requirement of 15 million in respect of the business grant schemes that is inclusive of the 10 million set aside because of ongoing judicial review proceedings for the 25k grant scheme. However, it is now clear that the judgment is unlikely to be delivered this year. Inescapable resource Dell bids have been made to the Department of Finance for £16 million. All of this 
9 million relates to cover required because of a financial transaction capital loan write-off and 6 million is as a result of increasing demand on the drawdown of grant assistance in Invest NI. A bid of 8 million has been made for higher education quality research which will increase economic productivity and prosperity and tackle major societal challenges. Bids totalling 16 million have been submitted to DOF for those COVID related initiatives that remain deliverable but were not funded in the summer exercise. The largest of these relates to a bid of 7 million for loss of commercial research income in higher education. Assistance to tourism accounts for four million pounds to, over, to support overseas recovery and business tourism. And there's three million for assistance to business to accelerate selective financial assistance to business and to fund the small business accelerator to support business growth. A bit of three million for inescapable COVID related pressures in the further education sector has been made to address a loss of income and to allow the provision of free school meals for under 19s in the current term. Moving on to capital, as previously highlighted to the committee members, a review of Capital Dell was carried out as part of the recent summer exercise and a 10 million reduced requirement was submitted to the Department of Finance. As a result, in October monitoring, there was only a small movement in the capital provision, leaving 1 million of unallocated Capital Dell. On top of that, a separate capital bid has been made for 6 million for Project Stratum. There is a reduced requirement of 15 million for financial transaction capital due to a surrender of 8 million by Queen's University and 7 million from Invest NI. The paper also updates committee members about the outcome of the DOF led summer exercise with 65 million pounds of funding received during August and September by DFE. As the committee was previously briefed, in the summer exercise, DFE grouped individual initiatives into themes to create high-level bids. Funding has been allocated at theme level, which allows flexibility across initiatives within themes for this financial year. Chair, that is a quick summary of the paper you have in front of you. Joanna and I would be happy to do our best to answer any questions you might have and to provide additional clarification and explanation. And where we cannot give you precise or complete answers, we will be happy to write to the clerk to provide the necessary explanations. Thank you. And thank you very, very much for that. Um, in relation to the bids that have been made um, and what you expect to receive, do you, do you have any indication of which that you would expect to, to um, have funded? Yes, um, I mean, I think we have obviously been engaging at official level um, with Department of Finance officials, and I suppose nothing is certain until, of course, the executive agrees to it. Um, we would expect to have funded um, the nine million um, financial transaction capital write-off. Um, we we have been engaging with DOF officials, and that is really a consequence of the the structure there that sits around financial transaction capital um, and what has happened early on in this loan. Um, so you know, would like to think that 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 nine million um, will be addressed. I think in the context of the other bids you will see and as, as I mentioned there that we have submitted um, the COVID related bids that, that remained unfunded um, you know I suppose it's just really hard to judge about those given sort of the situation even from when I, you know sort of I've written this paper things have obviously been moving on um, so, so we're probably in a different position so I really just don't know, don't know about those. And just to clarify, Sean, um, the FTC loan write-off, would that be FTC um, finance funding that would be is being bid for, or is it other? It's resource Dale. It's resource Dale funding. It's resource Dale. Yes, because it's um, um, it actually relates to the expected credit loss, so you have to take it through okay. your books um, in that resource Dale area. And in relation to the, the six million for invest that bit, is that resource deal as well or is that um, COVID funding that is being bid for in respect of that? Um, that is resource deal. Um, it, it, 
while it is related to COVID and the circumstances around COVID, it's not specifically um, packaged as a COVID bid. Um, I think if you remember back to June monitoring, Invest NI um, had surrendered £17 million of their budget at that stage. And obviously, sort of that decision had to be taken. It was probably early May time whenever they had to make that call. Um, I think that th their view was they might have seen a decrease in demand, given where we were at that point in time. But actually, um, the reality has, has panned out um, is that the demand didn't fall away in the way that they would have anticipated. Uh, so, so they're bidding for that six million um, to, 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 to help with that. Um, and just finally from myself then, um, as you mentioned, obviously this is an, an evolving picture with the, the new restrictions being introduced today um, and the additional funding that was made available on Friday from, from um, the, the Chancellor. Um, and I know the Economy Minister says on Monday that she has written to the Joint First Ministers and identified a range of supports. Um, and, and she also highlighted in that response, I think it was to Andrew Muir on, on Monday, that she is looking at supports for those who have been excluded so far from the supports, including manufacturing and, and micro businesses. Have any bids been made in respect of those as yet? Um, and also today, just there in the chamber, um, the, the First Minister says that she has been discussing with the Economy Minister the need to support those businesses in the supply chain of those being ordered to close who will also be impacted by um, lost income. So uh, are the bids going to be made as part of the Cooper monitoring or will there be a separate bidding process for those um, support schemes? Um, well, those um, bids that you refer to, the Minister's letter and what was discussed um, in the Assembly there just a short time ago, they're not part of the October monitoring. I think the situation has evolved um, since then. Um, I am not sure. We haven't had any information on what the process is for the addition of £200 million of foreign consequentials. I know that um, in, in the Assembly, the First Minister did refer there to the Executive taking decisions on this tomorrow. Um, so, so, you know, that's, I can just kind of say that they're not contained within the October monitoring round and at the minute they're not within the October monitoring round process, but, you know, I, I don't have any further information that may change. Okay, um, but I assume there is work ongoing in, in shaping those bids to try and do that work at pace if there is expected yeah. decisions to be made tomorrow? Yes, um, I mean, it doesn't fall to my division, it would fall to policy leagues on this. But yes, I am aware that work has been going on at PACE and, you know, the Minister has been engaged um, on that. OK, thank you from me. Um, I think John O'Dowd is um, first in there. Oh, OK, um, I welcome the bids that have been uh, tabled in relation to further and higher education. Uh, eight million pound bid for quality research and uh, oh, the further higher edu or further education of two point seven million and, and a number of other uh, bids. Um, can I ask, in terms of bids, well, obviously these will benefit students. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. But in terms of the students' hardship fund, has there been any consideration given to topping up the student hardship fund, uh, which I assume has been under pressure as a result of ongoing financial pressures being faced by students? Um, well, I'll let Joanna sort of maybe answer this more fully, but my understanding is as part of this monitoring round, the Student Hardship Fund wasn't identified as an area under pressure. I think that may be because students have just returned, but Joanna might be able to give you a bit more detail on that. In the executive allocations, when the additional grant money was given at the start of the financial year, there was 1.5 million allocated to Student Hardship Fund. There was an additional 1.4 allocated internally as part of June monitoring round, and we haven't been made aware of any um, pressure against that additional funding. Okay, I have a direct question into the minister, just in terms of how much is left in the pot on allocations, etc. So I'll, I'll wait the outcome of that. Uh, can I just ask uh, another question? Um, I note there's a £6 million capital bid for Project Stratum. What's that in relation to? 
That is in relation to the broadband for Northern Ireland. That, um, well, no, I know what the, know what the project is, but I'm just wondering why it needs six million pounds more. Um, well, it's it's really uh, the contract um, is in a position where it can be signed. So that's the money that's required in this financial year um, to, to start that project moving forward. So I, 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 the, the contract can't be signed. Is, is there a six million pound shortfall? Was that shortfall expected or is that as a result of whatever contracts has been awarded? Um, no, the, the, the six million falls within the overall funding element envelope for Project Stratton, um, but it's just six million pounds is needed this financial year. Right, so, so the, the contract... Sorry. Sorry, no, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, so DFE didn't have that money in its baseline um, from the start of the year, so it's really just us bidding to get that money in your baseline um, to allow the project to proceed, but it's it's within the overall funding envelope that had been agreed. Okay, thank you. That's, that's uh, thanks, John. Um, can I bring in Gordon, please? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, in relation to the easements, uh, I see there are a number of vacancies that haven't been filled, especially within the Department of Economy. What are the, the reasons for that? Obviously, COVID, which everybody uses as a reason now, but w why is it uh, with such a delay in filling these vacancies? And there's obviously quite a bit of uh, funding has been earmarked for them. Um, yes, I think that's something that um, the department has found very challenging, um, filling our vacancies. Um, as you may be aware, within the civil service, um, there's a centralised shared service um, for HR and vacancy management um, go, goes through that. Now, um, as a result of COVID, filling vacancies was suspended um, for a period of time. That has now restarted and um, NICS HR are looking at how they best recover uh, and fill these vacancies. Um, so yes, it has been, it has been taken forward by NICS HR, but it's, it's a very challenging position for the department, um, the, the level of vacancies within it. Right, I think obviously we're, we're aware, you know, if they need to, to deal obviously with the, the energy strategy, there's a lot of money has been set aside for that. For strategic policy and so there's significant bits of work that need to be done and obviously you need the resources to do it so something that we will certainly take up with the minister um john's point about the project stratum is that contract not about to go or we're understanding it was to be signed off in yes. the autumn yes it, it, it is so so that's why we're making the bid um and that will allow that project to commence and proceed okay um HMS Caroline, which we have discussed here at a number of occasions, we've spent four hundred and forty thousand. Is that right? To date on it. Well, that's yeah, that's what the business are are estimating that they they will need um during this financial year as they take forward the work on HMS Caroline to find a more permanent solution for it. Okay. Um, the other point, chair, is just to contract your commitment to the Londonderry Airport, 233,000. Is that an annual uh, commitment or is that a one-off? I'm actually not sure, Joanna. Do you know that? We might have to come back to you on that. No, I would need to come back on that if that's Yeah, we okay. would need to come back to you if that's okay. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Gordon. Um, is is next in? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, table 2 uh, tells us prioritise bids to aid economic recovery, and there's a range of items in there um, in priority 1 and 2. They're all in relation to assistance to business, skills and youth training. Despite <coughs> meetings with the Minister and despite the Minister's um, uh, indications that she is looking to uh, advance a scheme to support those who have not been supported up to now. Why is there nothing uh, there being set aside to assist excluded and others uh, for whom so far there has been no business support? Um, well, 
I think that that is something that I'm aware, you know, the, the minister um, is looking at um, and certainly is engaged with officials on. Um, in terms of the October monitoring, um, we were not in a position to make that bid within um, October monitoring. Um, it is something that um, can be taken forward um, with it within the context of COVID that um, the executive are looking at um, currently. Given the length of time that the minister has been aware of the issue, it, I have to confess that it's, it's surprising that there's nothing there at all, even a starter bid, even a, even we'll need to do uh, appropriate research to carry this forward. One other quick question. The minister indicated a couple of weeks ago when she was here that she would also look at the at, and request from the finance minister uh, further access to be able to veer funds within uh, the, her overall funding package. What progress has she made on that? Um, well, I think the last time I was here as well, um, you know, I had said that I had um, mentioned that to DOF officials um, in discussions and with the minister's agreement, I also raised it um, with, within the formal submission for October monitoring. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we did in terms of the summer exercise was we grouped bids into sort of higher level bids around themes. And while that doesn't give us authority to move completely across that whole um, tranche of money that was allocated, it does give us authority to move within themes so we can be more agile. So, so I think um, for, the, for the bids coming out of the summer exercise, we do have flexibility that we didn't have in the bids coming out of the June monitoring exercise. I have raised um, the issue around the June monitoring exercise and flexibility as part of October monitoring to see can we make any progress. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Sean, just to clarify then, Emily, no, but yes, just that, that response. The, the money that has been allocated as part of the, I think it was 65 million um, just there in September um, for, for COVID related bids, those bids, there's some flexibility within where those bids, that money can be spent. Yes, so if you, um, if you look at the category, for instance, um, assistance to business, so there were a number of initiatives within that that we bid for, um, but we have flexibility. So for instance, say within a category, there were five initiatives, we would have flexibility within those five initiatives. We wouldn't have flexibility to move between assistance to business and assistance to tourism, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes complete sense. No, that that's useful to be aware of because obviously, as we've just discussed, um, you know that that change in picture that we're seeing with restrictions being reimposed and, it, and that that flexibility may be useful down the line. Um, I think Sinead's looking in for a question as well. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's a couple of questions really around um, that flexibility as well. You know, we're concerned as a committee, and I think we've expressed it, you know, the, the fact that we could underspend money um, in some of the bids that um, have come forward, particularly um, two that were mentioned last week by Invest NI, where the applications um, have been very, very slow at the very launch of, the, of those bids or those programmes. So it's important that we're able to react very quickly uh, and put in place, um, you know, supports where they're actually needed. Um, on the ground, particularly now in the face of a new lockdown, and is that something that you have considered? You know, that's underspent, uh, and the difficulty that will be for for the department. Yes, it absolutely is something that we have considered, and you know, it was really my motivation for um, raising this with DOF officials. Um, so, you know, we have raised it. We totally acknowledge that the lack of flexibility may create an underspend. I think that's not. In anyone's interest, um, certainly in the current climate, um, you know, if we've been given money, um, you know, for the remit of this department, it's, it's right that we are able to spend it. But of course, that has to be balanced with um, the executive and their role and, and their approval role. Um, you, you know, so, so that's what's limiting the um, flexibility that things need to be agreed at executive level, which of course is correct. Um, 
but that the result of that then is it it does create a difficulty um, so as I said um, they're just in response to that last question I have raised this with the Department of Finance um, because I think in the current climate we need to be agile you know we need to be able to move um, as, as the picture moves and, and that is important. Yeah, it's absolutely important uh, and I think the decision making process needs to be very, very quick and very reactive because people are desperately in need of that support on the ground. The other thing that I would want to ask is um, whether it's possible at this stage that you have um, been able to quantify um, on the budget of the loss of various EU funding streams. Sorry, your sign wasn't great there. Were you asking about EU funding? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll let Joanna come in on this because she's done um, a good bit of detailed work on that. Joanna, I think you're on. Sorry, the can I ask for the question again? I sort of I missed part of it with the interference. Sorry, um, have you been able to identify um, just the quantity and the impact on the budget of the loss of EU funding streams? Yes, we have about £100 million a year flows either into the department or directly to our ALBs um, in regards to European structural funding, which would come in from the European Social Fund and ERDF, and then three other schemes which would flow directly to universities, um, such as Horizon and Erasmus, and then there would be obviously our Peace Plus and Interreg funding. And have you identified any other sources in order to fill that gap? Substantial gap. Well, obviously, the negotiations are ongoing in regards to the UK Prosperity Fund. So, of that hundred million pounds, around sixty-five million of it comes from what is considered EU structural funds, which is what the UK Prosperity Fund will look towards funding. And then there are separate negotiations ongoing for Erasmus and Horizon and those things that are not considered EU structural funds. But that would be the my colleagues in the EEX branch would be dealing with those negotiations. Okay. Can I ask one quick question as well? Probably this is back to you, Sharon. Um, it, there's been 80 million um, of, of FTC given to Ulster University plus a grant. Can you can you break that down? Why why was it given to Ulster University in that method? Because it, to the committee we were told here at the committee it was a one two six uh, million pound FTC, uh, and then when we 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 witnessed it. In, in, in the last round that it was broken down. Can you give me some detail on that? Yes, um, I can give you a bit of detail. Um, um, if, if you want um, something, you, you know, more detail than I can give you, we can certainly um, write to you. My colleagues in higher education can do that. So um, my understanding um, was there was 126 million or something like that. And um, 20 five million perhaps was converted to capital grant and I think that was just in the current context of COVID um, it was to de-risk the investment slightly for the University of Ulster um, because you'll, you'll um, understand from what I have said initially about financial transaction capital and the fact that we are now bidding for a, a nine million um, pounds resource Dell cover for a loss um, for, for an invest NI loan um, you know, financial transaction capital, yes, it's good, it allows projects to proceed, but it does come with more risk um, than conventional capital. So the um, the injection of conventional capital, which was available, um, has de-risked that slightly for the university to allow them to take forward their Greater Belfast development. Sharon, we have been told at this committee, you know, that uh, that the department were going to investigate just the risk and do uh, a capability review on Ulster University in relation to the payment for that, which was, you know, uh, it was due diligence to do so. Um, we have not had that report back to this committee, but yet monies have been transferred. So I want to know why. Um, we haven't been given that governance and clarity regarding the capability of, of uh, review that has taken place. Sure. Um, well, I think in that case, it would be best for my colleagues in higher education um, to provide an update to you on that, on the specifics of that question. Okay, thank you.
Chair, we'll seek that uh, update from officials as part of the response to the DALO uh, after the meeting. Okay, um, I don't think there's any more questions. Can Sorry, Peter? Sorry, Chair Gordon just wants to come in. Yeah, in relation. Yeah, no thanks, Chair. In relation to the, the COVID recovery heavyweight consumer advertising program across NI and the Republic, four million pounds bid. Is that still going to be forwarded, considering all the implications of COVID in the Republic of Northern Ireland, or is this still under review? Um, I think at the minute, the bids are as they stand. Um, but I do think um, it would be prudent for us to just confirm with some of these sectors that in the context of the announcement this morning, yeah. that still appropriate and um, now my understanding about that bid was it was to you know marketing to encourage recovery into 2021 so you know it may well still be appropriate um but i think i was i was having a conversation this morning with joanna about um whenever sort of we had heard the full detail of the announcement um that, that it might be prudent just to check with the policy areas um, that they were still content. Some of okay. these Makes sense. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, thanks, Gordon. Um, sure, uh, thank you very, very much for your presentation. And sure, we can follow up on any of the queries that, that members have, have raised directly with yourselves. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay, um, so moving on then to item number five, which is the departmental briefing on the apprenticeships. Um, sorry, apprenticeships and youth training recovery package. There is a clerk's memo at page three of the table papers and a departmental briefing paper on the apprenticeship recovery package at page seven of the table papers. Um, we were briefed on an outline of the package during some of the committee's meetings in August. Members will also be aware of the department's bids for the summer exercise, which has a focus on the development of our skills base, including reskilling and upskilling. The committee has also discussed that this issue at length and and is it set to feature in one of our micro inquiries in the next number of weeks? So, can we bring into the spotlight, please, um, Jim Wilkinson, who's Director of Apprenticeships, Careers, and Vocational Education Division of DFE, and Clement Athenso, who is Deputy Director of Apprenticeships, Careers, and Vocational Education Division in DFE. Um, Yep, these are both there. And, and if I just hand over to yourselves um, to make an opening statement, and then we'll open it up to members for questions. Good afternoon, Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity today to provide you with some further detail on the apprenticeship recovery package. The focus of the package is very much on short-term interventions, um, which are targeted to reduce potentially significant longer-term economic impacts. The interventions aim to reduce unemployment amongst apprenticeships and ensure that employers continue to have access to people with the skills and qualifications needed to maintain productivity and grow their business. As, as you've mentioned, Chair, in August, Minister Dodds announced that apprenticeships were being allocated 17 million in 2021, complementing 4 million allocated to from the department's internal central funds to support the package. I should say this um, additional funding is in, is in addition to the annual spend on apprenticeship training, which is around 26 million per annum across the department. The support will begin on the 1st of November when the UK wide coronavirus job retention scheme comes to an end. The scheme really is focused on the five months to the 31st of March, but there will be expenditure thereafter in relation to some fields of those schemes. Details of the recovery package is now available on NI Business Info. And on how to apply for the schemes has been up, will be uploaded this week and possibly today or tomorrow. Just to provide some context to the committee, at the start of 2020, Northern Ireland's labour market was in one of its best ever positions, record high jobs, one of the highest unemployment rates on record, and lowest unemployment in the UK, in the UK region, with skills shortages being identified as a major barrier. However, the impact on the economy has been dramatic, as recent published figures show. Uh, with unemployment rising to 3.7, the claimant count now at 62,000, um, which is 6.7% of the workforce. Number of employees on the government furlough scheme 
13 percent and 102,000. The committee, the committee will be aware of all these. But turning specifically to the impact on apprenticeships, from our own data gathered really from our training suppliers, which are FE colleges and, and other providers, and I imagine the position that may have changed further, it would suggest almost 46 percent of apprenticeships um, remain in employment, but 45,000, which is 57 percent of, uh, of being furloughed. 57 percent of these in our lower level apprenticeship programs, which are level two and three, APS and I, and 35 percent in our higher level apprenticeship programs, which are foundation degree and degree level. Nearly all of our participants are under 24, with the significant numbers in that cohort of 16 to 19. This shows to us that in broad terms, younger individuals, particularly at the lower end scale, are being more adversely impacted by COVID-19. And this really set the context in which we looked at our apprenticeship recovery initiatives. Our initial response um, to the impact of COVID-19 was focused on supporting participant learning and our training system. For that reason, we put in supplier relief measures to ensure the continued viability of the skills infrastructure. We developed alternative assessment um, awards and measures, and the committee has been briefed in those, and we provided ongoing learner support and facilitated apprenticeships under the age of 19 who lost their job to continue on the Training for Success programme, as well as developing a digital hardship fund to help learners access, in particular, online learning. Moving from these immediate steps, the department engaged widely to develop the apprenticeship recovery package, engaging directly with key stakeholders, including our own strategic advisory forum on apprenticeships, which is memberships of training providers, as well as trade unions and employer groups. The apprenticeship sector partnerships, of which we have 10 across various sectors, further education college principals, and a real key sectoral groups, such as manufacturing and NI, and indeed National Union of Students. Feedback from stakeholders were key in affirming the development of the package. There was a clear message that um, provide, uh, employers needed some direct financial support in order to have the confidence to bring apprentices back but also to continue that pipeline. Um, the department developed an apprenticeship plan with three main goals. Minimise apprenticeship job losses, maintain and grow the supply of apprenticeship opportunities and support apprentices who have dis been displaced or lost their job. To give some high level detail on the initiative, the Apprenticeship Return Retain and Results Scheme, which is primarily focused on the furloughed apprenticeship, is to help apprentices return from furlough and retain them until the 31st of March 2021 and to help them continue on to successful completion of their apprenticeship. The department will, subject to conditions being met, provide incentive payments to employers to support those three elements. The total amount payable will be £3,700, £500 in relation to the return element, which will be payable for the full month after the 1st of November, £2,000 for the retain element, which is really £500 per month up to the end of March, and a further £1,200 on successful completion of the apprenticeship. The scheme is open to employers participating on the department's, for the department's apprenticeship NI and higher level apprenticeship programmes who have returned their furloughed apprentices to work since April 2020. They didn't want to penalise any employer who has been bringing back furloughed employees prior to this date and who have continued to have those, those apprentices return from furlough at 1st of December. Turning to the um, recruit incentive, it's payable to all employers to support the recruitment of new apprentices. Employers will be eligible for up to £3,000 for each new apprentice opportunity created again from April 2020 to March 2021 and the bonus will apply to all new apprentice opportunities that includes apprentices who have been made redundant. The first payment is £3,000 after 90 days and £1,000 after 200 days. Again the scheme will be open to all employers who are participating on the apprenticeship NI or higher level apprenticeship programmes. Checks will be made to ensure that apprentices on similar pathways have not been displaced to support recruitment. Um, the department is working in pace to develop the structures and again, we hope applications will be uh, opened this week. We also introduced a challenge from the it, it was a particularly um, one of our key innovative approaches. Apprenticeships we know are beneficial to young people, employers and wider economy, but there are a range of barriers that can stop the expansion of opportunities and participation, and these have been exacerbated by COVID-19. The challenge from provides a short medium term benefit to assist mitigating the impacts of COVID-19, but also by allowing new employers, new groups, uh, new courses, uh, and innovate, innovative ways to try and uh, support the recruitment of apprenticeships. We haven't been prescriptive about it. However, things that we want to test are things like shared apprenticeship models. This is where maybe an SME employer cannot afford to commit to an apprentice for the two to three years it takes to require it, but with a group of similar employers might be able to provide employment over that period. And this is how would that be assisted. A brokerage model where um, a number of maybe small employers or sectors might come together and do joint recruitment 
to enable them again to, to have a bigger impact. But we haven't been prescriptive, but that's what we've been, been looking at in terms of this initiative. Um, the Challenge Fund has a budget of 5 million with up to 50,000 available to um, awards, which could rise to 100,000 where there are partners in terms of those awards. Uh, a challenge cost will be identified in letter of offer and successful applicants could include staff costs, costs involved collaboration, etc. The Challenge Fund was launched on Monday the 20th of September and applications will close on Friday 23rd of October and we already have had quite a few applications to that. I also think it's important, and the committee mentioned this at the last time, it's important that engagement takes place to make people aware of these initiatives. So we published the package on NI Business Info. In addition, we've circulated details of the package to our stakeholder groups to allow them to inform their networks. We attended local authority working groups and webinars to promote the package and guidance for apprenticeships uh, has been processed providing advice in terms of our, our, our link. There's also been a, a media campaign, which I'm sure some members may, may have come across. Chair, that was a very brief introduction uh, and a brief uh, talk to the update, but I'm more than happy to take questions with Ben. Um, thanks very much, Jim. Um, and certainly the, the feedback that, that I have heard around the, the recovery package has been positive, both from the, the providers and also the employers. Um, and I, I think the, the Challenge Fund in particular is, is a, a very positive initiative with a, a lot of potential. Um, and you, you mentioned, you know, that there is good uptake um, in terms, and maybe you, you don't, know this full detail yet but in terms of the, the proposals coming in um are you able to give us any kind of indication as to the, the things that are coming through you know you, you talked about the, the shared apprenticeship model and that that support maybe with the the admin side of things um is there specific things perhaps that are, are themes that are coming through i suppose um i mean again the, the, it doesn't close until the 23rd so we'll have more detail then but um I suppose, and I'll ask him to give a bit more detail on The thing that's been of interest to us is that A, there's been a lot of interest in it, so it shows to us there was a need for some stimulus. But uh, B, as well, there's been a lot of collaboration identified in it across sectors or working with employer types or employer groups. And we're also getting some nuances in terms of the bids. Now, they haven't all been assessed yet, but we're getting some nuances where not only is it about responding to COVID-19, and bringing in sectors that haven't previously engaged, but also trying to target particular cohorts that haven't engaged. So trying to you know, widen participation and access to maybe groups that are underrepresented in construction or engineering. So it's a whole mixture of, of, of bids that we're seeing. Ben, is there any more detail you'd like to give on that? Yeah, um, as Jim said, I think the, the learning for us is that we've got proposals that go beyond um, what we initially envisioned, in particular, as, as Jim said, about broadening the access routes into apprenticeships, in particular from underrepresented groups. And this is a big benefit in the short term in terms of having more young people with a really good opportunity uh, that aligns with our, our economy needs. But in the longer term, how we mainstream models that work well and build those into the apprenticeship system in the longer term. We've had three applications received so far, um, and we you know, had, have had 10 inquiries about um, applications. So we expect to see a, a decent range of proposals by the time the, the, the challenge fund closes. Okay, no, thanks for that. I think that that's really interesting feedback. And, and I do think if, um, if there are ways to, to learn from, you know, what models that are being proposed and, and pick up then on that best practice and, and mainstream it as you discussed um, but also if we are able to um, widen participation and you know for example be able to attract you know more women into engineering and, and construction type apprenticeships and things like that I think it, it would be um, a very a very positive outcome of it. Um, in relation to where we are um, like currently with restrictions being reimposed um, is there thought now being given to the potential need for further interventions in relation to retention and recruitment um, beyond what, what was initially planned with this package? Okay. Um, yes, Chair. I mean, I think two, two elements to that. The first is obviously um, we have to digest the, the advice today and see what that means, uh, both in terms of continued learning and any advice we need to give to our supplier base. I mentioned that we had guidance on distance learning. We had supplier relief packages in place and we have had a digital hardship fund, which has provided 
a lot of equipment to those who are finding it hardest to access. So we have to look at that in the immediate term to sustain learners. But longer term, uh, and as, a, as the sort of the impacts of the pandemic um, stretch out, as Clem has said, we are very mindful that we need to review the success of these initiatives. Now, we won't have these figures until probably December, possibly January. But if these initiatives have been successful, we have indicated um, in discussions around future budget years that there may be a need to keep some of these stimuli moving forward um, to try and help us get over the, the impact of the pandemic. We'll also want to take some learning from the structure of these to see what it might mean in the longer term in terms of how we build in employer incentives into our mainstream funding. We have them there at the moment, but they're primarily universal and targeted at the completion of the award. That's around 750 to 1200 pounds. You might want to look at that to see, should we be spending these a bit more to widen access particular sectors? So there's both learning that we can take forward, but very much mindful of the fact that we have some idea that we might want to put some um, markers down for similar budgets, depending on the response to the pandemic. And then just um, finally for myself, um, and, and we've discussed this previously, the, the need to expand um, apprenticeships to, to over 25 as well. Mm. Um, and is that something that has been considered in terms of the next year's budget um, and, um, you know, basically expanding these um, programmes? Very much to the forefront. Um, and I've been with the minister as well, who's indicated that it's one of her priorities. Uh, I'm very much making costs in that and putting what that would mean in the budgets. I should also say from our stakeholder engagement, it was a strong preference across stakeholders to widen apprenticeships. And they saw a couple of values to it. One of the values uh, related to um, the fact that it would widen access and increase, increase participation in apprenticeships. It's a way of providing reskilling re uh, for, for people who are displaced. So I think, the, the arguments and the rationale for doing it are building up, and we're certainly harnessing those and applying them to any bids that we're making. No, no, I think we, we, we'd, we'd all welcome that because uh, in the particular context that we're looking at now and, and the need to plan for the economic recovery and reskilling and upskilling, I think apprenticeships are going to have an important role um, and it is important that they are accessible to, to all ages and everything else as well. Um, so thanks for that. Um, John Stewart, I think, has indicated first. Yep, thank you, Chair. Thanks, gents, for the presentation so far. And uh, I would echo the Chair's um, views there just on how important it is to... Um, keep apprenticeships going and open that up to all age groups across as many sectors as possible. Um, there is obviously a lot of money um, and support in here um, going forward to try and um, roll out as many as possible, but I'm interested to get your feeling on how the lockdown has impacted on courses being able to be completed. I'm hearing anecdotally from a lot of people who would normally offer apprenticeships that, yes, the classroom-based stuff maybe is taking place online, but they can't get the hands-on work done, and that's then impacting them being able to take on another tranche because they haven't got the first one sorted. So what is your understanding of that, given that we're maybe heading into, we're heading into another one now that a lot of people will be imp impacted by? Maybe they're going to be beauty therapists or hairdressers, and they're doing apprenticeships and that. How is that impacting you know, what you're hoping to achieve down the line, uh, given how long these courses take? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you're correct. There have been a number of challenges. Um, we did previously brief the committee on, on awards, and thankfully, a lot of vocational qualifications have been awarded this summer and move forward. But there are certain cohort of qualifications which probably particularly affect some areas of apprenticeship that are fairly highly dependent on the ability to complete uh, an assessed work-based element. Yeah. And that can include hairdressing, it can include um, health and social care in particular. Um, now, thankfully, a lot of those um, workplace assessments are now have been moving forward from August into September. Um, and for us, um, those are being completed and we've had some figures and I can update the committee more, in more detail and I'll provide a written update, but we're aware that a lot of, a high percentage of those, um, if you like, hands-on assessments have now been completed uh, and they were, they were scheduled to go through from August and September. The, on, the, on, the, on the plus side, uh, most, of these, most of these exams are for people who were wanting their, their apprenticeship completed, so they were out of their apprenticeship into their full-time employment. It wasn't necessarily for progression into higher levels of education and those have been achieved. Um, so we're still able to complete many apprenticeships. Unfortunately, as a department, we're not actually able to issue the apprenticeship certificates 
because they're hard copies. Um, but we have been advising that uh, participants have been fully completed and providing them with details of that effect. And we're looking at how to provide electronic certificates. Moving forward, I think this is a very fluid situation in terms of awards and completions. Um, as sectors shut or as sectors close down, that automatically limits the amount of on the job learning that can take place, some of which is essential for the completion of apprenticeships. But we're looking very flexibly at how our vocational awarding system can adapt to that. And I think very much learning from this year's, where there was lots of learning to take place, it is underpinned by two ideas, which is flexibility, early messaging to those training providers about what can be done, and adjusting the arrangements as best we can to reflect the need, the need to ensure participants can, can complete their studies. Um, the bigger challenge for us, I think, um, is A, making sure that apprenticeships don't be reduced. But on the other side of the coin is the fact that our youth training also relies significantly on a lot of work placements. Uh, and if those work placements aren't available, that can be a real challenge. Those young trainees who are full-time trainees, but the work placement is in the key element of it. We've been working with our supplier base, which is colleges and providers, to A, amend our operating requirements to reflect the fact that we're probably going to be delivering in a different type of methodology or a fluid methodology and be trying to get a feel for them where the challenges are in terms of work placements. I mean, what can be done and, and what can we do to simulate a work placement if that is impossible? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, John. Um, and John, is next indicated. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, uh, John Stewart's covered a lot of the points I was looking to raise. But it's this issue of responsiveness. Uh, and I have to say also that the reports I've got back are very good about the scheme as well. You know, it, it, the, the inclusive nature of it, the fact that it was you engaged with the sectors in the development of it uh, has, has really helped. But in terms of the responsiveness, even in normal times, I think it, it is key to this. But at this time, it, it's absolutely crucial. But particularly in terms of, of the likes of Mid-Ulster, where engineering, et cetera, is a key component of the economy. Uh, is there buy-in and uh, the ability of this scheme to react to that, the needs of that industry? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll bring Clem into the detail because I know he's been leading a lot of discussions, particularly in the Mid-Ulster area. But yes, we were involved particularly with the manufacturing sector there, uh, and we listened a lot I mean, they, they helped us inform a lot about um, and certain, about the challenges faced, uh, and they were particularly unique. They were saying there's challenges now because um, there's, there's impact on our ability to deliver. We know our um, order books may go down, and therefore there may be a reluctance to recruit, but we also know that our long-term vision is a growth sector, so we need a skills pipeline. And they were very adamant in terms of, as well as returning the president from furlough, do what we can so we don't miss out a year's recruitment because that could have long-lasting impacts on our ability to meet the skills need we have. But Clem, do you want to say something about the interaction we've had with the mid Ulster area in particular? Yeah, thanks Jim, thanks for the question. Um, we've had a lot of engagement um, with um, the employers in that sector and that place um, as well. And I think in particular there's, there's two issues they raised. One is that there'll be a short-term drop in demand, which could really damage the long-term competitiveness of the, the sector to compete in the global, global, global um, marketplace. And so one of the focuses of the policies that we have in place in the schemes is to try and maintain that capacity. The second issue they raised, and it probably goes beyond the, the COVID space, um, but has been exacerbated by it, is by trying to ensure that the sector has access to the right skills and in that space, it's really important that the work of the sector partnerships supports um, the engineering sector and employers in that area so that apprenticeships meet the changing needs of the workplace, which are changing ever more rapidly now because of COVID. And it's important that the work of, of that sectoral partnership supports the changing skill needs of that sector. Okay. I, I thought your, your dog there, Clement, was going to make it is. It's, your dog behind you is beginning to arise. <laughs> Maybe we should have um, displaced her, but she may have caused more problems if, if I'd done that. So. She looks very comfortable yeah. where she is. <laughs> uh, worse, worse than that, I have a cat sitting beside me, so I, can hope, I hope you don't interact. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, John. Um, Claire? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
I uh, chaired, I know the chair did as well, uh, a policy form from Northern Ireland and it was in specific uh, to apprenticeships and I took great value from that, particularly the feedback that we got from businesses and their support for um, an apprenticeship model. Um, chatting on a, on a side conversation with one of the participants, um, they were talking about their shared skills programmes, um, which I understand you know, will have a, a certain uh, time of uh, theory, if you like. And then, but I think also within those, there is that experience element within uh, the workplace, and you know you do create those connections with industry to to try and ensure that that's valuable and could eventually lead to a job. So I'd be keen to hear if the department has any more uh, ideas around share skills, and um, can we expect more of those? Because I know the minister does say that she's quite uh, keen to progress some more of those, and, and what do they look like if if there is ideas? Um, well, I should say, from the, I said, the, the assured skill side um, sits with the with the other Wilkinson in the department, Graham Wilkinson. However, I'm very aware that I mean it is a model that that's really really useful. It's one that we've been looking at. It's one that's had um, a real focus on addressing in a short, short sort of twelve week period of time, upskilling young people into a new area. Um, it's particularly used at graduates. Our model to date. Has focused on groups of employers or single employers coming together, indicating that they have a range of they have a range of vacancies, and that what they commit to is working to help shape the program that's delivered, help with recruitment people of young people onto the program, and then offer um, interviews at the end. Moving forward, there's been uh, and Graham can give a lot more detail on this. There's two real initiatives under consideration. One is the extension of virtual academies, because that seems to be a model that can work well for some sector, and the second is investing more in academies but maybe even more speculative academies so rather than if, if employers aren't able to commit at the moment to significant vacancies and in interviews at least committing to saying this is an area of growth and we can start to involve an, an upskill in anticipation of jobs coming along so i do know it features in some of the skills bids that are being put forward in terms of responding to COVID both this year and, and moving forward into next sure um, yeah, and you know, certainly at that conference, uh, digital skills was talked about quite frequently, and and I think you know, given where we are, that seems to be to be where we're moving. And you know, your point around this being a short, intensive program that I think is usually delivered over ten to twelve weeks. Are there opportunities, given the challenges that we're now facing because of unemployment, to, to look at that as an opportunity to, I suppose, to divert people maybe into other areas of work um, that they may be interested in. Um, yeah, yes, as, as I said, I, mean, I think we're, we're looking at all our programmes, in, including our Shared Skills Academies, and I know it's something that, that I said, as I said, Graham's looking at, to see how it might be flexed to be even more responsive uh, and address some of the challenges that are emerging, possibly looking in particular at potential challenges around graduate unemployment. Okay. Um, no, I find it very useful. I'm sorry for bombarding you questions that were probably meant for the other Wilkinson, but maybe, Chair, if, if there was an opportunity to, to hear more about the Assured Skills Academies, because I do know the Minister talks about it a lot, so it, it seems that it might be on the, the agenda at some point in the future. OK, thanks for that. I don't think there's anyone else indicating for questions. No, Peter? Chair, I don't have any further members indicating. Right, thank you. Um, thanks, Clem and Jim, very much for the, the presentation. It has been really useful, and, and I'm sure we'll have you back to talk to us about it again at a later date. It, it would maybe be useful if we could get that um, written update that you referred to in relation to where we are with assessments um, being completed, if that's something yeah. that could be shared. Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, what I'd like to do is um, I mean, we can give the chair a bit of a, a written update. Um, both about the assessments in terms of qualifications, but maybe in a couple of months' time after the schemes in running to give a feel for what the uptake's been, because that really will be the critical to us. You know, how many people are returning from further, what does it mean in terms of recruitment levels for apprenticeships? So we're happy, happy to provide that. But in the first instance, yes, I can give a, an update on how many adapted assessments have, have taken place this year. That's great, Look, that would be very useful, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so moving on then, Peter, where are we going to next on, sure. on the agenda? If we go back to 6.7 in matters arising. Yeah, okay. So, sure, that'll be at the bottom of your page eight. Yeah. Yep, just getting there now. Um, 
Okay, so 6.7 then, there um, is at page 84 of your pack, the briefing from NIE Networks on their green recovery paper. Um, and obviously NIE briefed us last week um, and we had got the, 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 um, the briefing paper just a little bit late, so it's just to share it with members as part of their pack. So, so um, it's to note unless members have any um, further comments or suggestions they want to make. Chair, we, we plan to add that to our um, energy micro inquiry. It might just be worth flagging up to members that we have almost 190 <coughs> responses to that micro inquiry, which is it's fairly exceptional. Even your your usual classic um, six year six months year long inquiries, you don't get that kind of response. So it does show just how much interest there is in the sector. We're hoping to bring it back either next week or the first week back after the recess. Um, as you can imagine, with that number of responses to analyse and, and weave into a short report, um, it's, it's taking a bit longer to kind of make that work on themes uh, that we might have anticipated, but I just thought it was worth flagging up just the sheer quantum. Okay. No, that, that's very positive feedback. Um, so if we're moving on then, Peter, we had decided that we will move on to correspondence next. Yes, Chair. If we, if we pause um, item seven, which was the responses from the higher education institutions and students around COVID-19 uh, and the A-level results, because obviously now with the latest ministerial announcement, there's a whole other new set of conditions to deal with. So. Members have those responses in that pack. We'll seek a further update from the institutions and the students and the lecturers and then bring those back again. We'll try and get that turned around as quickly as possible because um, th those responses now are kind of, I guess, um, no longer as time relevant as they were. So we'll organise that and bring that back again to committees, Chair. So do you want to move on to nine then for correspondence? Yeah, and just... I suppose to say in relation to that, some of the issues will still be pertinent in, in relation to the, the need for that guidance uh, and support for students in particular, but I think it would be useful to get that additional briefing from them as well. Um, and so if we, it would be useful just to seek that. Sure, we'll go ahead and do okay. that. So, right, thank you. So moving on then to item number nine and correspondence at 9.1, there is correspondence at page 130 of your pack from the department regarding a, a letter from a business owner in relation to the self-employed income support scheme. And um, we had agreed to forward that to the department for comment. The letter from the business owner highlighted that company directors are excluded from the self-employed income support scheme. The minister has sent met, since met with the concerned business owner in their capacity as a representative from excluded NI at the meeting facilitated by Stuart and Andrew Muir. The department has stated the minister has met with the correspondent and discussed the concerns in person and a reply letter will not be sent. Um, I think this is an issue obviously that we continue to highlight uh, that we have raised with both the minister and also with the, the British Chancellor directly as well. Um, and we are continuing to raise it as part of the um, support package that is going to be needed um, for the businesses um, um, impacted by the latest restrictions and obviously that was something that we discussed earlier in the meeting. So do members have any additional actions that they want to suggest around this? No Chair, uh, no indication of, of actions Chair. Okay, so moving on then to 9.8. Two, um, at page 133 of your pack, there's a clerk's memo from the Committee for Finance regarding the forwarding of a response from the Finance Minister referring to information on mutual recognition of professional qualifications. At uh, page 134, there is correspondence from the Minister to Steve Aiken regarding some information on EU exit issues that are likely to come to the Committee for Finance. So it's for noting, and obviously we have been dealing with issues around mutual recognition of qual professional qualifications and everything else in relation to EU exit. So we'll be continuing to raise those issues as well. Are members content to note? Thank you. 
Um, 9.3 then, at page 137, there's a clerk's memo from the Committee for Finance regarding details of all bids submitted by departments within the in-year monitoring process and bids supported by costed uh, proposals for COVID-19 related funding outside the in-year monitoring process, including the purpose, value and outcome of each bid. Um, obviously, we've already seen these bids and, and we've had our briefing this morning from uh, the departmental officials, our members content to note. Thank you. 9.4 then, at page 145 of your pack, there's correspondence from Joan McAlpine, MSP, the convener of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee, to Bruce Crawford, MSP, the convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee in the Scottish Parliament, regarding her committee's views on the um, Internal Market Bill. Obviously, um, while both the Scottish and, and Welsh Government have laid LCMs detailing why they will not be pursuing um, consent from the department um, in relation to the IM bill. The Scottish committees have continued to debate it in their meetings and chamber. So it's for noting, and obviously we've had a, um, extensive discussion around the IM bill um, and have already written to the minister in relation to the LCM. So if the, unless there's any other actions to suggest. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Nothing else suggested. Early start there. Eh? Um, so, 9.5 million. Chair, go ahead. Page 156 of your pack. There's a report from NI Tourism Alliance on the scale of the crisis facing tourism. The report looks at recovery and rebuilding of the tourism sector across the region and the actions needed by the executive and the British government and the economic impact of COVID. Um, NIDA has communicated to the clerk that it would ask the committee to seek clarification from the department as to when it expects to complete due diligence on the draft tourism act recovery action plan. This will allow the sector to make plans towards the date. Additionally, the sector asks that the tourism recovery action plan is funded across the three years CSR period. Um, so the NIDA crisis paper recommends a number of actions for the executive at page 160 and 61 of your pack. So if members are agree, we will write to the department and seek those clarifications that have been sought um, and also write to the minister um, um, outlining the, the actions that have been um, indicated in, in the paper um, by NIDA and obviously we will be having Nilga talking about other tourism issues next week so it's something members might want to, to um, look at again for that. Are members content? Members content. Great. Yep. yep, thank you. Um, at page 166 then there's correspondence from an individual in regards to support for those who have to self-isolate. Um, the individual is concerned about the financial effects experienced by people who have to self-isolate and highlights there are people who cannot work from home and have been told by employers that they cannot receive statutory sick pay. In addition, they've highlighted that the government in England um, have introduced the £500 self-isolation grant to cover that two-week period um, and there's no provision as yet here. Um, and my understanding of the self-isolation grant is for people on low incomes as, as well and here we do have the discretionary support um, in place that was put in place earlier on this year in relation to people being impacted by COVID. So I know that's something that the Communities Minister has um, highlighted again um, this week. So I think yeah, if members are content that we would write to the, the Ministers um, in relation to that just to, to highlight the issue again. Great, yeah. Thank you. Um, 9.7 then, at page 167 of our packs, there is a copy of the 24th report of the examiner of statutory rules. Are members content to note? Great. Um, 9.8 then, we dealt with that correspondence under Chair's business. Um, 9.9, .9, at page 22 of table papers, the departmental responsibility um, in relation to the electricity directive regulations at our meeting on the 30th of September during the briefing from EU exit officials 
Um, we asked about the electricity regulations, which are said to risk significant material disruption and why there's not intent to lay these till December. The department has stated that it still intends to lay legislation in the Assembly during November to allow the statutory rule to come into operation prior to the end of December and meet EU obligations and that consultation in relation to those proposals ends on Friday the 16th of October. So our members content to note for now. Great, yeah. Thank you. At 9.10 then there is at page 23 of table papers um, a departmental response to the Association of NIE Travel Agents at our meeting on the 23rd of September. We consider correspondence from uh, the Association of NI Travel Agents um, regarding the lack of revenue due to the impact of COVID-19 and we agreed to write to the department. The department has indicated it has paid out more than 340 million across the three grant screens and travel el el agents were eligible to apply for all three business support schemes introduced. To date, 11 travel agents have benefited via the 25 K grants and a 30, 32 were able to receive grants via the Micro Business Hardship Fund. On the 1st of October, the Minister met with a representative of the travel agent industry and the Department has stated the Minister continues to examine and pursue further means to support the local economy and business sector. So um, I think it's something that, that we may wish to um, ask be looked at again in the context of the additional support that has been made available. Um, via the, the British Treasury um, and in the context of ongoing restrictions, if members are content. Yeah, great. I think yeah. it's important. The chair, so. um, Mr. Dixon just wants to make a point. Just, just briefly, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, those, Chair. Those payments, are, particularly the £25,000 payments, don't cover multiple premises, which yeah. has been a, a long yeah, issue. Yeah, sure. yeah. The other thing, Chair, just on yeah. a number of the premises didn't qualify because they didn't fit in within the rating bracket. That's right. Yeah. were excessive, a lot of them, and didn't, yeah. uh, were unable to get access to it. So I think we certainly should keep our, you know, the pressure on in relation to this. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, Chair, thank we, you. we'll go ahead Moving and on to seek further information items. on that, um, considering what's what's been made in the statement today, and also flag up that there's still a number of gaps. Yeah. Okay, then 9.11 the, at the page 25 of table papers, there's a statement from Causeway Chamber on executive discussions um, in regards to the COVID-19 response. Um, members seek agreement to reply to this chamber, highlighting the committee understands these issues and that we have written to the ministers highlighting them and, and will be continuing to raise the, these issues. Are members content to do that? Great. Thank you, members. At 9.12 then, um, page 26 of table papers, there's correspondence from the Hotel Federation um, in relation to the position for those trading in the Darien Bank um, Council area. Um, I, I know because I, I met with some of the, the representatives of um, the hotels in, in Derry in particular on Friday um, and a, a range of those issues were, were discussed. So if members are content, we'll write to the Minister and also to the, the Executive Office um, to forward that correspondence and highlight the issues. Um, and obviously it's something that's going to now be impacting across the board. Members content? Great, yeah. Thank you. Then at page 27 of table papers, um, there's a statement from the, the NI Tourism Alliance in relation to the announcement made by the Chancellor on the 12th of October. So are members content to include those um, in the correspondence that we discussed previously? Great. Um, in relation to NIDA. Thank okay, you. Yep. so then that's correspondence done um, and um, just if we move on then to any other business, I, I think when at the first um, session earlier on we, we agreed to come back and, and um, discuss the um, announcements that, um, and I, I suppose we picked up on some of the issues with the officials when they were in um, but we had agreed to, to write to the um, Economy Minister, the Finance Minister, and the the Joint First Ministers in relation to um, the need for that support package, and obviously um, 
the, the first minister in the in response to questions saying that she is discussing the the supports that need to be made available with the economy minister and there is expectation that those will be discussed at the executive tomorrow um, and obviously we have um, previously highlighted a range of groups that have been excluded from support previously that we would really like to see be um, addressed with additional support made available to them um, and we have discussed at length what bids that the economy minister has made in relation to those and I, I think it would be useful um, again to, to just highlight that to the minister um, and, and also what additional things are, are being looked at and how quickly that support is going to be put in place because I think that's going to be very important. Um, I know Gordon you wanted to come back to it. Yes, I think Chair, um, I would uh, just reinforce what you've been said. I think I just noted what we need is realistic funding support for these businesses that have been forced to close. I know the, the Londonderry case is ongoing and the general consensus we seem to gather was that the funding was in, inadequate really to, to meet what their expectations and uh, it's now a four week period and we're, probably all of us have been contacted through our social media contacts worrying people are concerned about you know, what they're going to do, loss of business um, and I think we would need clear, clear guidance I suppose on even the, the closing hours for, mm -hmm. for these businesses and I understand it was mentioned in the, the chamber as some of our, my colleagues have, have reminded me but uh, that's, that's something that needs clarification as well but we need to rally around as we've done before mm -hmm and support these people that have been forced to close and I think it's important we get that message out to our colleagues and to the executive before end of play today. Mm -hmm. Chair John Chair. sorry, John Stewart wants to comment as well. Yeah, thanks Chair. Okay, John. Thanks Chair. I agree um, wholeheartedly with what's been said. I think this committee needs to speak with one voice in terms of getting out and supporting businesses and, and trying to find as much support as quickly as physically possible. There'll be those who will be forced to close, who will be able to avail of the new furlough scheme in November when the old one ends. But there are those who have, who have no choice but to close because they can't get any business but aren't being ordered to shut, won't be able to access that. So we need to bear that in mind as well, how they're going to be able to pay their staff. Because you can guarantee the British government will be saying, well, your regulations aren't tight enough to force these people to take painter and decorators who only work at home. They're not being ordered to close, but they can't now because the regulations are preventing them from right. going inside. So there are so many, uh, so many facets to this, but the key is that £200 million support package has to be ready to go instantly. Most of these businesses have a two-week um, window of survival in terms of cash flow for the small companies. Yeah. They can't afford to be waiting six, eight, ten weeks, as we've been previously seen. So we need to get this out imminently. And like you, like all of us, I mean, it's just ping, ping, ping. Every business you could possibly imagine this morning is on wanting to know how they're going to survive, and we need to get that out as quickly as possible through the department. Um, thanks for that, John. And um, just uh, for for John and Claire's benefit, when we discussed it earlier as well, we, we did uh, mention specifically those businesses that you have referred to there, John, and those uh, in the supply chain of those that are ordered to close who are going to be impacted because of loss of income as well, and that there is that need then to, to put in place support for those supply chain businesses. So that's something I think that we will reinforce as well. Is anyone else looking to come in there, Peter? Chair Claire. Um, thank yeah, you, uh, Chair. Yeah, it's, it's just to reiterate what others have said. Um, I suppose one of the ones, um, and maybe the detail will come later today, hopefully no later than tomorrow, in relation to closing of a whole sector in hospitality and what that means. Um, you know, some people, even the Hotels Federation, are coming back and saying, is that hotels, is that overnight? Can we still open to take bookings, anticipating a reopening period and, and all of that? So, you know, I, I think for the sake of the sectors that we would represent on the committee, we, we need to have a keen focus to try and get that detail and interpret it for the people that we need to. The other one, and perhaps it's not a significant issue, given that schools are closed for an additional week, maybe what them, they, they would have been, in, in, in around half term, but childcare, um, you know, I, I think you know people in employment will be concerned what they do for that that additional week that they hadn't planned for, and you know what liability will be on them as parents. Are they able to, to take off? You know, will they be supported if they do? What you know, are they going to get full pay? Are they going to have to go down to statutory sick because of COVID related? Um, you know, it's, it's giving rise to all the same questions that seem to have existed six months ago, and sadly, the, you know, the answers weren't clear then, and they're no clear now. So um, 
you know, it's going to be a difficult four weeks, and um, I think again, it's the longer-term impact of the short-term um, restrictions. Um, and you know, I, 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 as a committee, the areas that we need to have a focus on, I think it would be useful if we can provide that detail, not just as individual MLAs, but certainly as a collective, because it will be stronger, as, as everybody keeps saying. So. Agreed. Um, thanks for that, Claire. And, and Peter, I think it w would be useful if we can reach out to our, our um, stakeholder network and just ask for feedback again in relation to um, uh, things that we have done previously um, and, and during the crisis to get that updated feedback of where, where they are now. Um, and then obviously we can share that with the department. Chair, we'll go ahead and do that. That that network's pretty pretty fast at turning stuff around, and they're constantly surveying their stakeholders, so that should be done pretty quickly. Okay. So, unless anyone has anything else for AOB, nothing being highlighted, Chair. No. That's great. Then moving on to item number eleven is the date, time, and place of the next meeting, which is next Wednesday, the twenty-first of October, uh, in room thirty at ten a.m. And just to remind members that there is an informal meeting tomorrow in relation to the anti fracking lobby at um, eleven a.m. via Teams. Um, so that is everything. Um, so if members are agreed, the meeting is adjourned. Yes. Yep. Right. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Chair. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.